Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the role of fintech in unsecured consumer lending to low and moderate income individuals. My name is Ambika Nair. I am a research analyst with the New York Fed's community development team. Please note that all remarks today are on the record and this event is being recorded. Please also note that all the opinions stated today are those of the speakers themselves and do not represent those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. There will be no Q&A during the presentations today. However, there will be an opportunity to submit Q&A questions during the panel discussions. We will give you more instructions on Q&A when panels begin. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are really excited to present our conference to you. I would now like to introduce David Erickson, our head of outreach and education, who will give welcome remarks for our event. Thanks, Ambika, and welcome everybody. Um, well, this is really exciting. Uh, my, my name is David Erickson, and I'm the head of the community development team here at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, and while the Federal Reserve is getting a lot of headlines these days over inflation and interest rates, I just want to remind the audience that our role is bigger than that. It's uh, to foster an economy that works for all segments of society. That's the mission statement of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And what we know too, is that the macro economy is made up of many micro economies and too many of those micro economies are struggling. So part of the reason those places aren't benefiting uh, uh, or contributing to a strong economy is unequal access to credit which is why we need new ideas for how to connect everyone with the resources they need to thrive. And that brings us to the topic of today's webinar, the challenges and opportunities that alternative data and new forms of FinTech might represent for low and moderate income borrowers. In preparation for this event today, I grabbed an event uh, memo that Ambika prepared a few weeks ago. I noticed the estimate uh, for the online audience in that, um, in that write up was 150 people. As of this morning, we had more than 1,000 people registered. So there's clearly a hunger for this important topic, uh, for more information on this important topic. So I wanna thank Ambika Nair uh, for being the moving force behind this event and our, uh, all of the, the members of our household financial wellbeing team here in the community development department. Um, and I also wanna uh, thank uh, especially Jonathan Cavell and Kelly Jackson, who were so instrumental in bringing this event about. And, and what I love about the event today and what we're trying to do our, our work uh, in community development uh, in general is to do with the historian, James Billington, who um, he, he, was, he ran the Library of Congress for about 20 years. And he used to say that his job was uh, to bring Greece, Greece into Rome, to marry ideas in mind with power and execution. Um, so in this, a short, in this short event, you'll hear presentations from researchers, to provide us with the ideas and insights. That's the Greece part. And then you'll hear from Rome, the technologists, lenders, and other innovators who are trying to bring good ideas to life to help low-income borrowers. So without any further delay, I'll hand the mic back to Ambika and thank you again. Thanks so much, David, for your welcome remark. I would now like to kick off the research segment of this event. Uh, please note again that there will be no Q&A during this segment of our conference, um, but I'm so happy to kick off our first presentation on how FinTech has changed access to unsecured consumer loans for low and moderate income households, which will be given by Eldar Basitov. Eldar is an economist with supervision policy research and analysis in the supervision division of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Eldar's work provides a real-time economic analysis of issues affecting banking and business conditions. His research focuses on how technology is transforming financial services. It's been a pleasure to work on research with Eldar, Eldar thus far, and without further ado, welcome Eldar, please begin your presentation. Because thank you very much, and I would like to thank the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for organizing this important, and as we just heard, uh, event that is already attracting attention, has already attracted attention for a very um, good reason. It is an important trend that has impacted many of our households. I did want to start out with a, with a, a traditional disclaimer that the views that uh, you'll see in my presentation are my own. They do not necessarily represent the Federal Reserve System. And let's jump right in 
um, and look at just how big the changes has been over time. The loans that fall into the unsecured personal loan category have grown at a really fast pace. And here, uh, by the term unsecured personal loans, I, I am referring to cash loans used by individuals for non-business purposes. They're not collateralized uh, by real estate or any financial assets. Um, when we look at the chart on the left uh, that is showing the total balances um, uh, per quarter uh, for the last few years, we see that uh, record high that has been reached of 192 billion in the second quarter of 2022. This is almost a third higher than what the levels we've seen before the pandemic. And originations um, that I illustrated on the middle chart uh, I have now exceed 5 million per quarter, which is um, also exhibits a, a really large and accelerated uh, rate of growth. So to put the 192 uh, uh, billion into context, um, it's useful to compare it to the consumer um, credit products of other kind. For example, uh, total credit card balances are at 887 billion, and this is according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, its latest issue uh, of that data for the second quarter also. And uh, the credit cards have also seen a large increase of about 50 billion since the first quarter of 2022. So there is an acceleration in those levels of consumer debt. Uh, we also see that the 2021 uh, reflects the impact of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, going into the pandemic and seeing the uh, coronavirus, coronavirus lockdowns and the decline in the economic activity, we actually expected that delinquencies will surge we naturally expected that lenders would limit their uh, lending, um, but um, delinquencies have never materialized. And of course, we can credit the uh, government stimulus for uh, um, for that. Uh, the stimulus had, was generous and actually worked. Um, and the money, uh, the types of debt relief that we have seen, such as the deferred mortgages and mortgage payments, student loan payments, all of that allowed to stabilize the household um, finances. Um, I, I, let's see the the last chart on the on the right. Once again, also illustrates as. Uh, 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 we go from 2017 to 2022, um, the share of originations uh, made by the FinTech groups. Now, this is, uh, if you were to compare it to all the way back to 2013, uh, the total number of uh, balance of loans was just 50 billion. Now, um, ha that has grown and the share of FinTech have grown from just 3% into um, the 38 percent that you see on this chart. Um, now, the geography of the personal loans um, differs, uh, also shows some uh, discrepancies, I guess. Uh, but let me first note the trend, and that is we are seeing increase in the sizes of an average loans. Uh, and for example, today the borrowers in Hawaii take out the largest uh, loans of almost $15,000. Last year, uh, the Hawaiians were taking out just uh, $12,000, uh, which is still relatively large when you compare it to the national averages. Those of you uh, uh, in Northeast, uh, for example, in New Jersey, uh, have borrowed about 12000 and uh, similar levels have been recorded in New York State. Uh, uh, Connecticut also, on average, um, borrows 14,000 in personal loans, and uh, that's $3,000 increase from the previous year. <clears throat> 
Now, uh, of course, this actually may indicate the fact that consumers not only have been pushed into uh, personal loan uh, loans, not uh, as the um, for various financial reasons, so they, they they actually making a rational decision to take on a fixed APR loan that will make. Uh, managing of of their loans uh, easier. So when we look at one more set of statistics um, that aggregate the total originations for the whole um, category, we'll, we see that the number of uh, Americans with a personal loan has increased to 25 million dollars that's about 4 million additional borrowers and for comparison uh, 190 million of Americans have at least one credit card the growth um, once again is attributed to the fintech lenders and the fintech lenders as the right hand chart uh, illustrates uh, it shows just how successful they've been in streamlining the whole process of uh, of underwriting personal loans. They use heavily the latest analytical techniques they, and as well as uh, alternative data. The loan uh, uh, by alternative data, uh, we mean uh, things that uh, go beyond the credit score uh, traditionally issued by a credit agency. And in this case, this could be a cable or utilities, uh, bills and the history of payment. We also have seen education and um, employment history as having predictive power in deciding that. And that those are the kind of statistic, uh, statistical techniques, but also data that is used by um, uh, by the fintech firms. Now, I did want to uh, break this down um, to uh, see sort of the trends within um, the credit scores groups. And this is a traditional, this is in this case, this is the TransUnion Vantage score um, groups. Now, uh, of course, fintechs uh, them develop their own proprietary uh, risk ratings, and those um, have, in fact, uh, shown uh, uh, th that they carry predictive uh, value when it comes to uh, the credit worthiness of the borrowers. Now, the uh, the share of loans with uh, credit scores below prime has now reached um, uh, 66 percent, and this is the stacked bar chart on the right. Uh, that is the largest share that we have seen, and what's interesting is that uh, coming out of the pandemic, we have seen that acceleration in lending to the subprime um, borrowers in this category of consumer credit. So um, for uh, us today uh, at this meeting, it is especially useful to look at um, how per, uh, the households, uh, individuals, the borrowers in, um, in the uh, below prime groups have performed. And so in this case, we have seen, not, I'm sorry, not performed. This is how they've been treated by uh, the uh, lenders and in this case we have seen an increase um, of credit uh, going towards them i want to once again emphasize that the the lending to the below prime risk tier is not necessarily imprudent on any uh, part of the transaction so there are borrowers that actually have been shown to benefit from the unsecured personal loans one of the panel members today marco dimaggio for instance has uh, used the term invisible primes to describe the credit worthy borrowers that have um, very low credit scores and short credit histories. And uh, they, he has shown that they can actually gain from 
um, from a personal loan of this kind. They display also the same borrowers, the invisible primes, display better economic outcomes when it comes to other types of credits. And uh, we also see in multiple studies that alternative data can in fact um, have predictive power in forecasting credit worthiness. So, uh, for example, the research has shown that um, uh, fintech uh, machine learning based algorithms uh, can in fact identify individuals that have low probability of defaulting. And like I said, those extend to other types of um, credits like uh, credit products like credit cards. So, uh, the, of course, fintech companies benefit uh, financially, they profit from those successfully identified prime uh, borrowers that would be otherwise uh, dismissed as not credit worthy. Now, if we were to look at the delinquency levels, there are some signs of, uh, well, if not danger, to at least uh, of the fact that we need to be paying attention to this and other categories of consumer debt. We have seen that serious delinquencies, and here I define it as 60 uh, more days that have passed due, have risen um, uh, for the 15 consecutive months if we were to look at that. And of course, uh, that is still historically relatively low levels, but though they have already reached um, the pre-pandemic levels and now actually exceeded. Um, if we were to look at the breakdown of how those delinquencies vary by the type of lender, we see that um, we see that increase in the number of borrowers that have passed due for the in the, in the last month have already reached um, higher levels, specifically for let's say fintech. In this case, the, on the very left you see the finance company. Those are companies that do not care offer deposits to their borrowers. But um, I, when we, excuse me, uh, let's see, um, when we look at the geography um, of the delinquencies, we also see an increase in, um, uh, in the levels uh, by different measures. So here, once again, there's a 60 or more days delinquents. Uh, and we see, for example, in Texas, the rates uh, that were 3.5, the latest reading is 5.6% of borrowers that are delinquent. In New Jersey, the uh, level was 1.4%, and that has climbed to 3% by now. Now, uh, if we would dig into the uses of the unsecured personal loans, the charts here indicate that most of the time U.S. Customer, consumers use them to consolidate higher interest uh, debt, uh, which is once again a really prudent decision on the house, on the um, part of the borrowers. One thing that I would uh, bring your attention to: we have seen an increase of uh, use of the personal debts for medical expenses uh, among um, the lowest income groups. So it, it, during the pandemic, and that, and that uh, is unusual and compared to the rest of the uh, groups. Finally, um, I did uh, want to let me bring you um, into the last slide that I have, and that is, um, the lower income borrowers tend to borrow a much larger share of uh, their annual income. And that of us may be dangerous. They are of uh, us doing this um, for multiple reasons and the macroeconomic conditions are probably the ones that are forcing it into this. So we, we definitely see the, the weaknesses uh, when it comes to um, that particular group. The data that we have here is up through the second quarter of 2022. 
Um, and, and by the way, I would like to thank Ambika who has uh, helped me uh, analyze this personal loan level data. And I will, um, uh, I will start start to wrap up because that's exactly what, uh, what I should uh, do at this particular moment. I do want to say that uh, I hope that I have illustrated to you just how important uh, this issue is and has become increasingly more important for borrowers in the lower income categories. With that, thank you once again for your attention and thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much for your presentation, Eldar. To our audience, please look forward to a post-conference brief co-authored by Eldar and myself, analyzing in greater detail the FinTech unsecured personal loan space for LMI individuals to be released in the next few months. I would now like to quickly introduce our second research presentation by Eric Dolson on his paper with Jalapa Jagpiani of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia on which lenders are more likely to reach out to underserved consumers, banks versus FinTech, versus other non-banks. Eric Dolson is a data scientist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington, DC. He performs data analysis to help inform policy decisions related to increasing access to finance for underserved communities, and also engages in research on FinTech topics such as FinTech lending and digital currency. It is a pleasure to have you present your research today, Eric. Thank you again, and please begin your presentation. Sounds great, thank you, Ambika. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting some research that I worked on with Jalapa while I was at the Philly Fed. Um, and so we look at the types of consumers that fintech firms are reaching out to with their uh, credit mail offers. And so we have a big data set that includes all of these um, credit offers that are sent to consumers via mail. So, you know, when you get like the little uh, card from Capital One that's offering you a credit card, you know, in your mailbox, and then you immediately throw it away, <laughs> probably, as some of us do. Um, that's the, what we have in our data set. Um, and so this allows us to see uh, who exactly um, different types of lenders are reaching out to um, for, their, for their products. And so just by way of background, uh, I'm sure we all know that fintech firms have become a growing presence in different consumer credit markets. Uh, especially personal loans, but also um, mortgages and auto and um, student loans. Um, today, we're going to focus specifically on personal loans. Our paper actually looks at mortgage loans as well. Um, so just to illustrate this growing presence, um, so TransUnion in 2019, for example, estimated that fintechs held 38% of all personal loan balances in 2018. So this actually gives them the largest market share of any of the other lender types that we look at, um, like banks, credit unions, finance companies. Um, and looking to the graph on the right, we see with the data set that we have that um, personal loan mail offers by fintech firms have also increased substantially um, since the early 2010s. You'll see, so the fintech firms are in orange. Um, you'll see that offers increased really substantially up until around 2017 and 2018. And then, of course, um, decreased quite a bit during the pandemic um, just because, you know, there wasn't as much demand for personal loans at that time. Um, but it's still, you know, well above early 2010 levels. Um, and so this kind of begs the question, who are these offers going to? What types of consumers are fintech firms, um, you know, trying to get their credit products to? And so that brings us to, to me to our research question. So more specifically, we are interested in knowing if fintech lenders target consumers who, um, you know, are considered underserved. Um, more so than traditional lenders. And we think of being underserved in sort of two ways. One is from a demographic sense. Um, so just different groups of consumers that have historically been underserved, like um, low income consumers, um, minority consumers, um, you know, consumers in rural areas, that kind of thing. Um, so we look at some variables related to those characteristics. And then the other characteristics we look at are more direct measures of credit access or um, credit history, such as um, credit score, whether a consumer had a credit denial, um, whether they live in an area with less banking services. And so we measure that by looking at the number of bank branches. Um, and so we look at it in these two different aspects and see if fintech lenders are reaching out to them differentially than traditional lenders and then other non-banks. Um, and so in the paper, we also um, do a rough comparison of the interest rates offered by these different types of lenders. Um, I won't go into that today, just in the interest of time, but if you would like to see that, please read our paper, <laughs> um, which is available on the Philly Fed website. 
Um, okay, and just to talk a little bit about our data, just briefly, so um, you know people can be aware of that. Um, the main data set that we use that I was referring to earlier is called the Mental Comfort Media data, data set, and this is um, that big data set of credit offers. And so how they do this is Mintel contracts with a random sample, well, stratified random sample, of around 8,000 households every month. Uh, these households um, forward all of their mail, their you know credit mail, onto um, Mintel, who codes it up and puts it in this data set. Um, this is then merged with TransUnion data. So TransUnion data has information on the consumer's credit history and um, credit file. Um, and then there's also various demographic uh, characteristics that Mintel gets through a survey that they do. And so then all of this data is merged. So at the end of the day, you have this um, really you know, rich data set with information about the type of uh, credit offer, different aspects of the credit offer, like the interest rate, the term, the loan term, you know, all different types of things. And then also characteristics about the consumer's credit history and some demographic characteristics. So it really gives you a good view into the supply side of um, consumer credit markets. Uh, and just to say, so our sample is um, uses the period 2015 to 2018. Um, and we merge this data with other data sets as well, mostly at the zip code level, such as um, data from the American Community Survey to get other demographic characteristics, um, like the percent minority in the zip code. Um, we also get the um, the zip code level average uh, risk score from the CCP and some information on bank branches from the summary of deposits database. Um, and so one thing I guess I should mention just to highlight this before I go into the, the rest of the presentation is so we're looking just specifically at credit offers, not necessarily originations. And so this is really, um, you know, more of the supply side, we don't necessarily see how supply and demand interact. So it, we're just seeing the types of consumers that fintech firms basically are hoping to um, get credit to. Um, now, just to kind of uh, get a little bit of intuition what this data is telling us. So here in this graph, we look at the total mail volume sent to um, consumers broken down by the household income of the consumer. Um, and then also broken down by whether the consumer is prime or has a prime or non-prime uh, credit score. And so you see we have four income buckets. The, the lowest is less than $25,000 uh, in household income. So we kind of consider that to be uh, low income. And then um, on farthest on the right, we have households with incomes of greater than $75,000. And we consider that to be higher income. And then we break this down by the type of lender sending the offer. And so a few things are you know, very apparent from this graph. Um, Firstly, it's pretty clear that fintech firms are definitely targeting uh, a more non-prime population relative to traditional banks. So you'll see that for the highest income group, around 30% of fintech mail is going to non-prime consumers compared to only around 11% of traditional bank mail. And so that that you know that's a very clear finding from this graph. Um, and then of course you see that finance companies or you know um, traditional non-banks are actually sending even more mail to non-prime consumers. And that's true across all income brackets. Um, and this kind of makes sense about how we know finance companies typically operate because they tend to have a business model focused on um, the lower end of the credit score spectrum. And so FinTech firms seem to sit somewhere in between those two, uh, traditional banks versus finance companies. Um, another thing to note is actually the um, most, the largest portion of FinTech mail goes to the highest income bracket um, so that might be a little bit contrary to, you know, what people have thought. And this is just for the personal loan market, I'll say. Um, and so, and conversely, uh, these finance companies are definitely reaching out to a lower income spectrum. Um, those with incomes um, less than fifty thousand um, dollars. And so, yeah, we learn can learn a lot from um, this graph. But now I'll go on and. Um, Talk a little bit more about our statistical results that we have in the paper. And just to give a little background on our empirical approach, um, so we just run a series of logistic regressions um, that just look at whether um, a mail piece comes from a fintech or another type of lender. We compare traditional banks uh, with fintechs separately um, with fintechs compared to non banks uh, because these types of lenders operate pretty differently. And we have all of our independent variables of interest for uh, the various. Uh, consumer characteristics we're interested in. Um, and so I'll just go through the results really quick. I'll put up the statistics here, um, but I'm going to, you know, walk, walk you through these. So don't worry. Um, so again, some headline findings, just like we saw in the graph earlier, it's pretty, very clear that fintech firms are targeting 
a less prime population than traditional banks. So you'll see these negative coefficients on the prime dummy, um, meaning that prime consumers are less likely to receive um, fintech mail. So non-prime consumers much more likely to receive fintech mail. So basically mirroring what we saw in the graph. Um, as we also saw in the graph um, here, the income dummies, we can see that the highest income group is slightly more likely to receive fintech mail. Um, uh, so, you know, we can say that fintechs seem to target a slightly higher um, income population than, um, than banks. Although the differences aren't huge, it's only a three percentage point difference, but, you know, that still comes through. In terms of other measures of credit access or you know, potential difficulties in measure in getting access to credit. We do see, interestingly, this is kind of a, an unusual finding that we weren't expecting that consumers who've experienced a bankruptcy were quite a bit more likely to receive um, offers from fintech firms. So 27 percentage points. So that's, you know, a pretty huge uh, difference. So it does seem like fintech firms are targeting this group specifically, even though that's obviously not a huge portion of the sample. But within the sample, it, those consumers are receiving um, more fintech mail. Um, similarly, uh, consumers who've experienced a credit denial in the last six, month, or six months are more likely to get an offer from a fintech firm. Um, so another measure of, you know, consumers potentially having difficulty accessing credit. Um, on the other hand, uh, we find that consumers with higher balances are much more likely to receive fintech offers. Um, you know, so cons consumers who have higher, and this is both revolving and non-revolving balances. So maybe they have a mortgage or a student loan and um, credit card debt. The higher that is, the more likely they are to receive a fintech offer. Um, and kind of weaving all of this together to tell a story, it does seem to um, be the case that um, fintech firms may be targeting consumers who, you know, had good credit in the past. They were able to build up these relatively large balances, but then um, maybe missed a credit card payment or just kind of overextended themselves and saw their credit score deteriorate. And so now um, they may want to turn to fintechs to get a personal loan to refinance their credit card debt or you know some other type of debt and that fits in really well with what we know about how a lot of fintech firms operate or um, their specific um, you know business plans which is often um, refinancing credit card debt through a personal loan and so these results dovetail very nicely with kind of what we already know about how fintech firms a lot of fintech firms operate um, so we also compare fintechs to non-banks and I um, won't go into these as in depth because we're you know running out of time. But um, we we see again mirroring what we saw in the graphic earlier that fintech firms tend to um, target a, a higher income and less subprime population than non banks. So they they basically sit in the middle between um, traditional banks and non non banks or financial companies in terms of the the credit score of the population they serve. So banks typically serve a more prime population, fintechs are somewhere in the middle, and then non-banks serve a less prime population. Um, and that's what our results are showing here as well. Um, and then, you know, also non-banks serving a, a lower income population as well. Um, and then of course, we d we're not looking at the interest rates charged, so it, it could be the case and often is the case that non-banks are serving a lower income, lower score population, but at much higher rates interest rates. Um, and so we're not looking at that here, but just in terms of who they're targeting with their offers, um, it is this um, more subprime and lower income population. Um, and so that is, let me, yeah, just to kind of summarize um, what I've showed so far, uh, we found that, you know, fintech firms definitely reaching out to subprime consumers relative to traditional banks. They sit somewhere in the middle in terms of when you compare all of the three types of lenders. Um, so, you know, a slightly less prime population than traditional banks. Um, interestingly, they are targeting slightly higher income consumers um, than traditional banks and non-banks. Um, and so, like we said, it's probably these consumers that have just um, recently had some credit issues. And so now they're trying to refinance their debt with a personal loan. All right, so that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Eric, for your insightful presentation. As Eric mentioned, please do check out his research paper with Jalapa Jekthiani um, to find out more about his results, not only related to personal loans, but mortgages as well. Um, I'd like to thank both of our research presenters today for giving us the informational foundation we need for our panel discussions to come. Uh, now we will be taking a short break for a few minutes to stage our next panel. 
Um, we will return to our first panel on FinTech perspectives, existing product models and opportunities for LMI borrowers. So uh, we will return at 310. Uh, we will see you in a bit. Welcome back everyone. I would now like to introduce our first panel on FinTech perspectives, existing product models and opportunities for LMI borrowers. This panel aims to overview models for FinTech in extending credit to LMI individuals and answer the question, is there an opportunity for FinTech to reach the underserved? We will have a brief Q&A portion in the last five minutes of our session. You may submit your questions in the Q&A field on the bottom right of your screen. If you want your question to be addressed by our panelists, you must make sure your drop down menu is set to all panelists when you submit your question so that we receive it. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this panel, Todd Baker. Todd Baker is an academic and former business executive and lawyer who works on business and policy issues arising from the digital transformation of financial services. Todd is currently a senior fellow at the Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business, Law and Public Policy at Columbia Business School and Columbia Law School. He has also been a senior fellow at the Musavra Ramani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School and an adjunct professor at Stanford Law School. I would now like to welcome Todd to introduce our panelists today, Jason Rosen and Ezra Garrett and kick off our panel discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to be here and many thanks to the New York Press for putting together such a fascinating program. It's my goal to add to the fascination today by interviewing two fintech leaders whose respective businesses have been pioneers in lending to low and moderate income individuals. Jason Rosen is the CEO and co-founder of Pedal, a New York-based credit card company on a mission to expand access to financial opportunity, as well as a founder of Prism Data, a next generation transaction intelligence platform that helps businesses serve more customers, build better products, and make smarter decisions. He served as a member of the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board and previously practiced law at Gunderson, Detmer, and Sullivan and Cromwell, representing tech firms and financial institutions. Ezra Garrett uh, is the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Impact at Opportune, an AI-powered digital banking platform and a community development financial institution, or CDFI, with a mission to provide inclusive and affordable financial services. Opportune recently expanded its product suite with the acquisition of Digit, the well-known fintech savings app. Ezra leads the company's government relations, corporate communications, community impact, and ESG programs. So let me start out the panel by asking um, how you see your firm's role in the fintech lending space for unsecured consumer loans and credit cards, specifically to low and moderate income uh, individuals. I'll, I'll start with Jason. Um, what's your view? Thanks, Todd. Um, and very excited to, to be here today uh, to join this great conversation. Um, for, for those who aren't familiar with our business, uh, Pedal uses open banking data and cash flow based underwriting to make safe and affordable credit much more accessible to consumers, particularly people who lack credit scores. Um, we, together with our bank partner, uh, which is WebBank, uh, offer a suite of credit cards um, together with a modern mobile application that helps people to manage those cards and their financial lives more broadly. Um, we launched our first card in the market back in 2018. Um, and so we're now in our in our fifth year of business. Um, given the nature of our business, which is um, serving people who are new to credit, uh, have thin credit files, um, have lower credit scores uh, such that they don't have access to mainstream credit. Um, the vast majority of our customers are low and moderate income. Um, in particular, if you look at the 50 million credit invisible consumers in the United States um, that we seek to reach using our products, um, they are disproportionately low and moderate income, as you, as you may expect. Um, they're also disproportionately made up of demographic groups that have historically lacked access to financial services. Um, this market is not a niche, however. Um, we're talking about tens of millions of people 
um, that lack credit scores or lack the score that's necessary to access traditional, safe, affordable financing. Um, and many of the customers that we serve, um, if not for a product like Pedal, um, would not be able to access a mainstream credit card um, or would have to uh, use a much more expensive uh, credit product. Um, it's, it's modern technology and a modern approach to data, open banking in particular, uh, that allows us uh, to serve these consumers and give them more opportunity uh, than they would otherwise uh, have access to. Great. Um, Ezra, how about you and Opportune? How do they view the opportunity in the uh, LMI space? Jason, it's great to be here with uh, both you and Jason. Um, Opportune, we were founded uh, back, I think, in 2005, a little bit before my time with the company, made our first loan in 2006. And we were really founded uh, with a specific focus on credit invisibles uh, and primarily Latinos uh, here in the U.S. Um, over time, we have gradually expanded uh, our mission to include all credit invisibles, credit invisibles plus misscored, uh, all consumers. Uh, who could use our help, as Jason noted, um, if you don't have a credit score in this country, you are shut out, not just of the mainstream financial system, but you're shut out of a lot of opportunities and a lot of job uh, uh, requirements uh, in, include a credit check, um, a lot of rental opportunities, whether it's a, a car or a, uh, an apartment require that as well. And so our mission was focused on helping those consumers not just find an affordable alternative to the really high cost uh, options that are out there if you need a quick loan or a small loan, uh, but to do that in a responsible way so that we're able to put those folks into the bureaus. Uh, since we were founded, we've helped uh, over a million consumers, primarily LMI people, to establish their first credit score. Um, we've been certified as a CDFI since 2009 uh, the vast majority of the people that we serve uh, are in LMI communities, primarily people of color. Um, we were founded with a focus on sort of in-person retail engagement. I think the conventional wisdom has always been that with a consumer who is uh, new to a financial product, a formal financial services relationship, um, you kind of need that extra kind of high touch in-person interaction to, to, to get folks comfortable, to help them through and be successful with the product. Uh, we've expanded and grown. The majority of our loans and lending happen now online, uh, but we still have both, uh, operate both channels. We operate what we call an omni-channel approach. Um, so I think when you sort of look at it uh, in terms of, you know, what's our role? Our role is to serve our member. Um, our role is to serve our member in a way that helps them to get not just into the bureaus, but to have an affordable product. Um, but I think we also see our role within the space um, it's really is validation that uh, fintech lending can happen at scale in an affordable way, in a way that lifts up communities. Um, our company is largely reflective uh, of the communities that we serve. The vast majority of us uh, are people of color, uh, people who self-identify as women uh, or people who have uh, historically been uh, underrepresented, including each level of management up to our board, 70% plus of our board, are women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ. So, um, you know, I'll kind of pause there. We can dive deeper into different aspects of it, but at a really high level, uh, we see that as our role to, again, continue to expand and meet the needs of not just LMI people, but, but people across the country and to expand the ways that we can help them. You mentioned the acquisition of Digit, you know, being able to marry not just what we do on the credit and lending side, uh, marry that to the opportunity to build savings organically. Uh, for a person that uh, is of modest means. So, uh, so again, thank you for including us. Thank you to the Federal Reserve uh, of New York. We're really, really ad admirers of the work you've done to study credit deserts. If you overlay that across the LMI census track map, uh, there's a lot of correlation there. So thank you also for all that you do there. Great, Ezra. Um, so uh, in the US, low and moderate income individuals have long, uh, there's a long history of relying on uh, burdensome forms of debt, including, you know, most notably payday loans, auto title loans, and on relying on on things like overdraft to deal with their liquidity challenges. How do you think fintech 
has impacted usage uh, of these types of products for LMI uh, individuals? Is it really creating alternatives? Let, let me start with you, Ezra, and then we'll, we'll ask Jason for his views. Yeah, so I, I would certainly, you know, self-interested, but I would certainly say, yes, FinTech is providing a, a meaningful alternative and we can kind of use ourselves as a, as a data point or a series of data points to, to validate that. I think uh, in terms of the approach that we take, um, you know, we really see the, the the barriers that come with a lack of credit score as being the thing that pushes folks into these more expensive options. Um, and so where I think uh, our solution, the FinTech solution broadly uh, is able to bring, uh, you know, a positive impact to that situation is that we can all look well beyond the, uh, the, the credit score so that we can underwrite a person uh, who needs help. Uh, and I think where the FinTech aspect really comes in is that we're able to do it quickly. You know, it's, it's not just the uh, availability um, that is bringing people to, to take advantage of these other options. It's the fact that they can get that money fast. And um, I think that's another aspect that FinTech can do. It's not just an underwriting program, but it's the ability to, to d disperse that, that money very quickly so they can meet the urgent. It's generally a very urgent need that a person's trying to address. So when I think about, you know, how, how do we prove that we're, we're making a difference um, for Opportune? We partnered with the Financial Health Network to do a study that looked at the markets that we serve and the products that are typically available to a person uh, with a thin file or no, no, uh, no, no credit score. Uh, and what they found is that in general, the alternatives to our products and pricing on average are seven times more expensive, up to 24 times more expensive in the case of the online options. Over the course of our history, that's translated uh, into uh, billions of dollars in savings for the people that we serve. So we sort of look at that as one measure, at least with our consumer base. You know, we've we've made um, you know over 14 billion dollars in loans. We've made over four million loans, um, but you know for for I'm sorry, over five million loans. So for us, in terms of our member base, um, you know we feel that we've sort of helped to keep that money in those households, in those communities. Um, and, you know, we're happy to offer other data points as well, but, uh, you know, FinTech, I think really has the ability to do this at scale and to grow very quickly. Our, our, our digit product um, has been around for a long time, you know, 10 plus years, you know, not all FinTech is brand new, but with digit, uh, they've been able to help their members generate uh, over $3,000 in savings uh, annually. And, you know, these are, again, people of modest means, these are households that are also avoiding at the same time overdraft fees, uh, over $8 billion in aggregate savings that have been uh, organically uh, built through digits. So, um, so I think that we serve potentially as, as a strong proof point that FinTech uh, can work when responsibly applied. That's an interesting point about how it's not just the lending side, but also the personal financial management saving side that can make a difference. Um, Jason, you're using a, um, a product not normally uh, associated with uh, LMI individuals, which is the credit card. Uh, how do you feel about uh, your impact on uh, your customers in terms of uh, avoiding some of these burdensome alternatives that they've traditionally relied on? Yeah, um, so just to kind of take a step back um, and set the, the backdrop for this conversation, about half of the U.S. population has a prime credit score, um, a little bit less than, than half, and, you know, it fluctuates some. Um, but about half of the population has a prime credit score, and half of the population does not. Um, and among those folks that do not, you have category of consumers with no credit score, the credit invisible, 50 million or so. You have consumers with thin credit files, and you have folks that have lower scores um, that have maybe had some issues with credit in the past. Um, for most of this non-prime category, um, mainstream financing options are not available. The types of everyday, safe, affordable credit products that are heavily used by prime consumers um, may be entirely unavailable uh, or difficult to uh, to access for the 150 million in uh, the other category without a prime credit score. Um, but only a small fraction of that 150 million people will ever actually default on a loan. It is the uncertainty associated with whether or not they might default on a loan that ends up holding tens of millions of people 
out of the mainstream system. Um, what we aim to do, and uh, Opportune does this brilliantly as well, um, as being one of the pioneers of alternative data and alternative underwriting. Um, but we aim uh, to uh, shine light uh, in some of these w less well understood areas um, to better understand the financial circumstances of these consumers. Um, when you look at the very expensive financial products that are unfortunately um, the only option in many of these segments, um, essentially, instead of doing uh, intensive, accurate underwriting, the risk, the uncertainty is priced into the product. By charging so much money, a lender can uh, say yes to lots and lots of people without doing the hard work up front. Uh, but that ends up being uh, you know, an expense that's borne by the consumer and borne by consumers that are um, the least positioned to, to, to pay for very expensive financial products. Um, something that I really love about FinTech um, is that you see business models um, and strategies that are uh, uh, aligned in a way by necessity um, with expanding access to opportunity. Um, markets like the credit card, for instance, um, that you know the, the market that we're in, uh, credit card is a very competitive, very mature marketplace with big players that are deep pocketed, lots of money on marketing, advertising, and so on. Um, there's very little opportunity for a new player to come in and challenge American Express. Um, but in the segments that American Express doesn't serve, there are real business opportunities. And you see this in banking, you see this in other forms of lending as well. Um, a lot of these fintech companies actually you know, have, have built businesses around expanding access to credit. Um, and that's really quite powerful. In, in terms of our impact, um, and Todd, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of the customers that we reach wouldn't have access to a credit card otherwise. In fact, over the last year, 43% of the folks that have been approved for pedal cards were first declined by a mainstream issuer. Um, so they tried their bank first and they weren't able to access the product. Um, and we have, uh, we've got great outcomes data at this point which shows that this is working. If we look at the uh, consumers that had uh, no credit at the time that they started working with Petal, um, so Petal's their first significant credit product, um, they go on to earn a credit score of just under 680, which is a prime score. It's a great illustration of the point that in using more data, in building products that are tailored for these audiences, um, we can really uh, help to identify people that are credit worthy, that can um, uh, manage a mainstream financial product like a credit card successfully, um, but that have been overlooked by some of the blunt tools that have been relied on in the past, credit scores, high interest financial products, or and high fee financial products, et cetera. Great. Um, so uh, let me ask you, you know, thinking about your, your business as a whole, both at Opportune and at um, Pedal. Um, is it possible to have a business where the entire customer base, a lending business where the entire customer base is LMI? I mean, uh, you, Jason, um, uh, cited some statistics. I'd be interesting, interested to hear uh, Ezra um, talk a little bit about what percentage of the Opportune customer base really is LMI, and, and are there aspects that differ in different geographies, or how do you think about you know, who you're targeting? Are you really just trying to reach a, sp a very narrow demographic or, or, or where are you, uh, you know, where are you focused? Starting with you, Ezra. Uh, yeah, well, th thank you, Todd. Um, we, so I would say, yes, absolutely. It is possible to uh, drive a sustainable, profitable lending business uh, at, full, at fair and affordable rates, uh, focusing solely on LMI. Um, LMI credit invisible, uh, you know, going even further, uh, and for for us, the, the the proof point there is that until a couple of years ago, um, ninety percent of the people we served were from LMI communities. We tracked this very closely, largely as part of our annual CDFI certification, which again, it's annual and it's uh, it's very involved. Um, and um, uh, you know, for us, you know, the a little more than half historically of our customers were not just LMI, but also credit invisible fully. And so we were able to build our business 
again, into a sustainable place. I think it was 2016 or around there where we hit profitability. Uh, and as a company, uh, you know, we're, we're one of the few organizations uh, that has continuously driven the pricing of our products down uh, as we've scaled further uh, and grown. So, so it is possible for us at Opportune internally, it has always been our aspiration to serve uh, people wherever they are uh, that could use our help. It has also been uh, a, a strenuous um, amount of encouragement, uh, even, even a demand by our consumer advocacy friends and uh, policymakers uh, that we apply what is working well with this a challenging uh, demographic to, to underwrite. You know, can't you bring this to other consumers that could use help as well? Um, so, uh, so for us, you know, it was never our intent to, to limit. It's, you know, over time, uh, when I joined the company, I think our mission was focused on 26 million credit invisible Latino families in the U.S. Uh, and now uh, it's vastly expanded from there. Um, you know, you would be correct in inferring that the majority of the people we serve are still from LMI communities because as a CDFI, it's got to be 60% or more, uh, but it's nowhere near the 90% tick anymore. And for us, uh, it's been an, an exciting challenge to continue to grow and learn about how we can you know, establish product market fit uh, with an entirely new demographic. Uh, and we do this not just through expanding the, the demographic aspect in terms of who we serve. Uh, you know, we've been challenging ourselves to expand the products and services uh, that, that we can offer as well. Jason, we, we admire the team at Paddle. You guys were in credit cards way before us. You know, we, we really focused on kind of the, the base of our business. Um, but, you know, as we've kind of continued to grow, we've added credit cards um, and, um, you know, we've seen really the pull uh, of our consumer base uh, as it has expanded and has, you know, demonstrated a stronger favorability or preference towards, you know, online channels um, you know, bringing in the, the digit team uh, into the opportune family, uh, we, we're excited that that's going to help us to further scale, uh, not just within LMI communities. The, the percentage of LMI we're serving is shrinking, but it's not a function of us serving fewer LMI people. It's really a function of us serving more people that are not LMI. Great. Um, let me ask uh, Jason. Um, you know, it, it, we all know that um, there were structural aspects or are structural aspects of products like payday loans, which make them uh, particularly dangerous uh, for uh, low income people. What do you think of, you know, when you're designing products? How do you try to um, take into account um, uh, the, the making the product work for the customer base that you have? Sure. Um, and I, there, there, there's really kind of two aspects of our business that are differentiated from a run-of-the-mill credit card offering. Um, the first we've been talking about, which is that we underwrite the product in a very different way. Um, we tap into a lot more financial data to better understand the financial circumstances of consumers, even those that have, perhaps have no credit, credit experience in the past. Um, the second piece uh, is offering consumers a digital product, um, which we do through a mobile application um, that helps them to manage that credit responsibly. Um, uh, it's terribly important for our business. Um, you know, all, all financial services to a certain extent, you know, needs to be compatible with the online world and the mobile world these days. Um, but when working with consumers uh, that are less financially experienced uh, by definition, in fact, when you think about what our company is here to do, it's all the more important that we provide the tools, the education, the guidance that they need to be successful. Um, we have an expression, you know, it's uh, up on a uh, it's on a poster on the wall of our office that it says that, you know, we're here to help people build credit and not debt. Um, so we're, we're, we're not trying to um, build a product that gets people into, into more trouble, but of course, um, with uh, borrowing, it can be a very powerful tool in people's lives, can really help advance their financial goals, but it can also be a destructive tool if not used uh, responsibly. Um, and so, you know, we designed the product sort of ground up with uh, these customer segments in mind. Um, and so a few things that we do that are pretty different from the rest of the industry. 
Um, one, we've boiled down the whole experience of managing a credit card to be very simple, very intuitive, right on your phone. Um, I think we might be the only credit card uh, company uh, 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 in the country that actively discourages people from carrying a balance. Um, so we encourage every customer to pay off their full balance. And if they carry a balance, or if they're contemplating carrying a balance forward, we actually calculate what the interest cost will be in the future um, for that customer. We uh, were the first and only credit card, well, maybe not first, but we were the only credit card at the time that we launched that didn't have any fees associated with it. Um, we've tried to remove things that uh, misalign our incentives with that of the of the customer. And you know, you might ask. Well, you know, if you discourage borrowing, um, aren't you uh, aren't you giving up a possible revenue opportunity associated with that borrowing? Um, we really don't uh, see it that way at all. Um, we think about long term relationships with our customers. Um, we want to see them succeed in their first credit card, build credit, um, and continue to advance in their financial life. Um, hopefully, with pedal being you know some some part of that um, over the long term, um, and I, I would say that you know this strategy of really putting ourselves on the side of our customer um, has resulted in some you know some, some some really interesting and positive things. Um, a couple examples: um, we have the highest net promoter score in the entire credit card industry. Um, our net promoter score is in the seventies. It's you know, 10 times higher than what you see from uh, traditional uh, incumbent uh, credit card businesses. And our retention rates are much better than similar credit cards. Um, do you attribute that to the alignment, uh, the clear alignment that the customer can see? I do. Um, I do, at least in part. And if you read the reviews that customers leave for us, the qualitative feedback, um, they think of Pedal as a more trustworthy alternative to a traditional financial product. Great. Um, so let me continue with you, Jason, because we've sort of touched on this topic a couple of times. Pedal's best known in the industry for really pioneering the use of cash flow data uh, in the underwriting of credit cards. And, you know, that's had a significant impact on who you can serve and how you serve them. Can you talk a little more about that? Uh, has it, uh, you know, what impact has it had on your ability to, to reach these people? Do you also use standard credit scores? You know, do you use other types of alternative data and machine learning outside of cash flow? Talk to us a little bit about that whole process and, and the role that cash flow uh, plays in differentiating what you're doing from others. Absolutely. Um, and this is really core um, to uh, our, our, our business and, and um, sort of the, the innovations that we're working to uh, bring to the market. Um, we started uh, with a fundamental question, which was how uh, can um, a financial services business underwrite consumers that lack the traditional data that's relied upon for mainstream credit decisions. And, you know, today, I think the stat on FICO's website is that FICO stores are, are used in 90 something percent of all of the credit decisions that are made today. So there is a, an overwhelming uh, uh, consensus approach to underwriting. What do we do if that FICO score doesn't exist or doesn't tell the whole story? of a consumer. Um, there's a great technological shift um, that is happening right now um, towards more open access to financial data. Um, consumers increasingly have real ownership over their financial records, um, their own bank statements, the history of their assets, their income, and the bills that they pay. Um, and consumers can now increasingly share that information digitally as a way to demonstrate their credit worthiness. Um, we've built um, a system that allows consumers to do that so that they can come forward and say, hey, uh, maybe I've never had credit before. Maybe there's not a bank in my in my town that would extend credit to me or my family, but- or a new immigrant. New immigrant, um, you know, uh, someone who's been through a divorce who didn't have any of their uh, financial information in their own name, um, someone who's young. There's so lots of reasons why be credit invisible. In fact, I like to remind folks that we're all born credit invisible. Um, <laughs> have to work our way our way up. Um, a consumer can come forward and say, "Hey, I might not have a developed FICO score, um, but I have a. Uh, I've been making money. I've been paying my bills on time. Maybe I've got a little bit of savings, and all of that 
can absolutely establish creditworthiness. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, but you don't know the utilization, you don't know how many trade lines they have. Let me tell you that there's nothing uh, carved in stone that says that those are the only data points that are predictive of creditworthiness. Um, you know, the elements that go into the credit score have much more to do with what data was available decades ago when those scores were developed. But the yeah, fundamental question- Very funny because of course I'm old enough to remember the time before credit scores. I, right. <laughs> one of the highlights of my legal career was taking Fair Isaac or FICO public. Uh, it was when it was a, uh, you know, a darling young technology company. And at that point, nobody used credit scores for anything. They used cash flow data. They just collected in a very clunky way. That's right. That's right. And, and so, you know, sometimes the way that I describe the innovation of cash flow underwriting in the manner that, that, that we do it today, it has more to do with uh, how we access the data and how we analyze the data, doing that in a really seamless, automated fashion. Um, which allows us then to apply the process to small dollar lending. Um, the idea of looking at someone's bank statements to determine if they're credit worthy is nothing new um, uh, to your point. And in fact, it happens every single day um, with, with paper documents and manual underwriting for larger loans, mortgages, small business loans, but not credit cards where things have to happen really quickly. Um, but unfortunately, these kinds of small dollar loans are really the products that open the, the door to everything else. They're on the front lines of credit access. And so what we've done is automate this more comprehensive, more accurate approach to underwriting so that it can be applied to small dollar credit on the front lines where it matters for people who are trying to break into the system for the first time. Um, and to answer the, the second part of your question, uh, we do use uh, uh, traditional data as well um, when it's available. Um, so, you know, our view of how this should work is that um, in this in this century, uh, consumers should have uh, when they're when they're applying for a financial product that could change their life, right? Uh, the ability to build credit, to finance a car, or purchase a home. Uh, consumers' uh, uh, accurate, complete financial picture should be taken into account. Simple as that, right? Doesn't sound doesn't sound too uh, 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 too out there. Um, that includes your credit history. It includes the, the history of your borrowing, um, but it should also include your income, your cash flows, your assets, the other bills that you've been paying that you don't get credit for in the, uh, the, the, the traditional bureau system. Um, and so we try to construct that complete picture. Um, and in doing so, um, we're able to say yes to a lot of people that the banks say no to, and we're able to charge less for a credit product than uh, we otherwise would. Right. Um, Ezra, uh, what what mechanisms outside of FICO does Opportune use? Um, and how has that helped, or has it helped you expand um, the credit universe um, in the LMI space? Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, I would say plus one uh, to everything that Josh shared, you know, he really shared what you shared is best practice. Um, and it's funny, a lot of it is grounded in the old fashioned principles of, you know, you've got to, you know, evaluate ability to repay and willingness to repay. And so uh, at Opportune, you know, we pull in uh, from uh, over 20 different uh, data sources. We are working with billions of actual individual data points and we apply machine learning at what we call it supervised machine learning uh, across all of it to, to look at, you know, what are the opportunities for us to develop, you know, kind of predictive models. Uh, based all of all of that, and then we when we deploy it, you know, we deploy it in a static state, um, so that it doesn't, you know, up, you know, update itself. It doesn't help itself. Um, and for us, you know, when when we look at, um, you know, uh, developing a sense of a willingness to repay, we look at certain things. You know, I have to give my disclaimer. This is, you know, a lot of it's pr proprietary, but. Uh, some of the types of things we look at are, you know, the amount of time someone's had uh, their, 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 their cell phone. We look at the amount of time that they've spent uh, living at a particular address. Uh, and again, these are not full on determinants, uh, but, you know, we pull all of these together and we're able to pr produce uh, a, a pretty uh, complete and detailed picture that allows us to, again, establish some level of predictability. Um, some of the other things that we look at on terms of, in terms of ability to repay, you know, we, we verify everyone's income and we're able to automate that, you know, using technology. Uh, we also do, uh, we, we perform pretty sophisticated uh, type of cash flow underwriting as well. 
And so, you know, we kind of bring it all together. And again, what, what I think makes it uh, produce a bigger impact um, than the sum of these individual pieces is the fact that we were working with a really extensive data set, um, you know, again, you know, over, you know, many, many years of, uh, you know, first party data as well. Um, we're able to uh, produce um, outcomes that we think are really unique. We've got over a thousand end nodes uh, in our in our credit box. So, um, uh, so again, it, it's a lot of what what Jason said, but really grounded in the old fashioned principles of you've got to put in the work to establish uh, ability to repay, uh, hardcore underwriting, uh, and uh, credible data points to help you understand potential. Willingness to repay. I, I think it's also useful to reflect on what we don't use. Uh, we don't use social media. We don't use, you know, some of these more kind of exotic pieces. You know, th these are established data sources. It's just that we were able to cross check these data sources with our own data sources uh, to uh, to produce a unique result. And I suppose, in contrast to the, you know, looking back to the past, the the big difference is what you just described. Uh, Ezra would have taken days or weeks in the past. So. Um, uh, you know the data sources you're you're working with. I presume must um, be able to generate that analysis, a fairly complex analysis, a multivariable analysis, pretty quickly. It, uh, what what's the timing essentially on a credit decision at Opportune? A, a customer can get can get a loan uh, applied for and disbursed to them in an hour, within an hour. Um, and uh, you know sometimes you know we, we do still require a lot of important. Uh, you know, verification steps. So sometimes, uh, because we have an omni-channel uh, sort of experience, uh, we can still hit that mark. If a customer starts an application online, they have to come into the store. You know, they prefer to show us a document instead of upload it, uh, and vice versa. So, um, or they can call in with information as well. So, so, so it varies because of your omni-channel approach. And I assume in Jason's case, since it's all digital, it's it's pretty much more consistent. Huh? Yeah, in our case, um, all, all of the credit decisions are automated, um, so they're all made in a matter of seconds. Right. Yeah, yes, yeah, same for us. We don't have a human touch uh, any of the stuff, uh, and you know, I think when we think about speed, that's kind of the price of admission if you want to compete with some of the kind of community-based, expensive options that we're trying to give folks an alternative to. Um, that's great, but in terms of the, the model itself, um, you know, as a fintech. We're able to update our models very, very quickly. You know, we can deploy a new risk model or an update to our risk model um, re really fast. I, I, I don't want to take a guess on the number because I'll probably get it wrong, but this has been particularly useful as you know, we're a company that's been through multiple credit cycles and have consistently performed uh, really well. Our borrowers have performed uh, really well, so I think that that's also when we think about you know alacrity uh, that comes with being a high-performing fintech. That's an important dimension as well. So, um, to wrap up here, uh, before we uh, take a couple of questions, uh, you know, uh, the, the trend in fintech has been uh, to uh, rebundle and add products and services and Opportune has been adding, you know, savings and investment products I've noticed over the last couple of years. Um, do you see your, you, you know, yourself expanding and creating, um, you know, a broader set of products for this customer base um, or uh, maybe in the case of Jason, you're very focused on one particular um, product line. You know, how do you view this question of whether uh, you can be more or less a monoline or need to be a um, a multi product uh, company? Maybe starting with Jason, maybe. Yeah. Um, so we're uh, we're a younger company than Opportune, uh, so we haven't been at it for for quite as long. Um, but uh, in, in fact, we have a couple lines of business today. Um, so in addition to the consumer credit card product. Um, we've actually taken this cash flow based underwriting technology that we've developed um, over the last you know seven years um, and uh, are now making it available to other banks, credit unions, and fintechs that want to use this approach to underwrite consumers that they otherwise couldn't reach uh, or to increase the accuracy of their underwriting across the board. Um, we call that PRISM data. Um, and it and really sort of gives, a B2B thing. Exactly. To B2C, yeah. Exactly. Um, and uh, you know, actually, you know, this is I haven't uh, been on a panel in a uh, month or so, and so uh, I'll, I'll share some, you know, ne never before, um, never before before shared information that at this point we've now had the ability to test cash flow based underwriting, or as we call it, cash scoring, um, 
in now a multitude of different contexts. Um, personal loans, buy now, pay later uh, products, um, uh, home loans. Um, and we're finding that cash flow based underwriting continues to provide strong predictive power across different product categories and different segments. We're even starting to, to do some work internationally now um, to see how well cash flow underwriting can translate to other countries that may have um, even less in, in terms of credit data available um, to them. So that's been an exciting kind of new frontier of our business. Um, in terms of uh, the consumer side, um, we've been very focused on offering a great credit card product um, to these customers. We offer a few different credit cards today um, based on the customer profile and, and uh, a, a need. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're really excited about is the relationship that we build with our customers. Um, it's a long-term relationship. Uh, the, the, the customer sort of retention for us has been very strong and better than peers. And the engagement is very high because we become an everyday product that people are using to put gas in the car or, or buy groceries or whatever it is. Um, and so over time, you know, I would say that uh, it's our hope that we have the ability to uh, uh, continue to meet the financial needs of our customers. Um, and that could include things outside of the credit card category over time as their needs develop. Um, but uh, uh, no, no, no timeline to share on on that or sort of what exactly. And, uh, do and next. Looking at uh, Ezra, you're, you're pretty far along in that process, right? But still, probably um, a way to go. Is it entirely focused on the one customer def demographic and their needs? Uh, is it needs driven, or is it uh, profitability driven, or you know what what's really driving you to choose um, areas to move into? You know, I think for us, um, one one of the things that we look at is, you know, where do we see our existing member go for other products and services? Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, with Opportune uh, several years ago, you know, we started noticing that the majority of our Opportune customers, after we put them into the bureaus, they were going off to get a credit card and, and an auto loan. And so right. that kind of drew us, you know, more seriously in, in the direction of those two products. It's been a longtime aspiration to help. Uh, support uh, the building of of savings for our customer base as well. So, so we 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 always have an openness to try to see if we can meet more needs. Uh, and what we look at first and foremost is, you know, is there a widely uh, adopted set of consumer principles uh, that can be applied to the product? Can we do that ourselves in a sustainable way? And um, uh, so, so the, the short answer is, I would say we're always open to it. You know, we, we just bit off a big chunk uh, in terms of our inter, uh, integration with uh, with Digit, which is going quite well. Uh, but I think that, that we're we're very much open. Without a timeline in mind, we're very much open to looking at other ways we can support our members. Okay, well, great. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Ambika to uh, deal with some questions. Sure, thank you all for a really insightful discussion. I've got two questions picked out and hopefully we can sort of get to them in the time we have remaining. Um, but the first question is, uh, FinTech seems to be providing options for those with low or no credit scores, but LMI individuals are also more likely to experience acute financial shocks and losses more frequently. So how do we create options for LMI individuals that address the growing volume of short and long-term disasters they face due to illness, fraud, theft, disaster recovery, disability, and more, what kinds of products help here and what considerations should we make? Uh, I, so I, I can uh, just offer a, a, quick, a quick thought. Um, one of the things that we look at as we consider launching a new product or service is we also look at, are, are there um, complementary uh, services that we can also bring uh, with that product that will help the customer not just be more successful with the product itself, but to help them to addri address you know, other challenges or open up the opportunities that come, for example, with the credit score. Um, so you know, just using our personal lending as, as, a, as an example, um, we opted uh, many years ago to offer uh, a financial coaching session, a live financial coaching session with a bilingual coach um, to help a person, you know, kind of talk through all of their financial needs, you know, what are the issues, you know, is there, a, is there an income issue, you know, can they connect them to other employment resources, is there an insurance issue? So, um, I, I think that, you know, it's, there are much larger underlying and foundational challenges that are putting the people we serve 
in a, in a bad position. Um, you know, we oftentimes we do recognize that sometimes what we offer is a band aid, and we do challenge ourselves to see if we can uh, you know bring more interventions in uh, through the use of partnerships. And I, I would just uh, quickly add to that that um, you know we we've done some thinking about you know how consumers can weather financial shocks. Um, so an unexpected gap in employment or an unexpected expense uh, that comes up. Um, you know, one of the ways that you know, access to a line of credit can help is that, you know, it can be there in the case of emergencies. That's the way a lot of people use, uh, use our card. They keep a lot of that available credit ready in case they need to smooth their, their cash flows. Um, so, you know, access to credit is a big part of that. It's not the whole story, though, uh, to Ezra's point. Um, you know, saving is a very, very important piece um, of kind of res financial resilience um, and something that maybe, you know, we, we can help our customers to do uh, over the long term. Insurance is an important piece um, of this story as well. Um, the, the, the last thing that I would add is that although Petal started off working uh, just with folks that had thin or no credit history, um, over time, we've been able to expand to also work with people who've had some issues with credit in the past. Um, and for whom the credit score doesn't really tell their whole story. Um, credit scores or negative information on your credit report, I should say, um, sticks with you for a long time. You know, the, the negative mark is on your credit report for seven years, um, but people's financial lives change quickly. Um, and so, you know, if we look at a consumer who four or five years ago had an issue, car accident, medical issue in their family, whatever it is, that has since resolved, we can look past the credit score and say, look, this is somebody who's able to pay their expenses today. We see that they have a stable source of income or whatever it may be. This person's actually more credit worthy than the score would, would indicate. And we think we can work with them in this kind of a financial product. Well, thank you so much. And with that, we have unfortunately reached the end of our first panel on FinTech Perspectives. Uh, I'd like to take this time to thank Todd, Jason, and Ezra for graciously sharing their insights and experiences with us today about FinTech credit products that aim to work for everyone. Um, we will now be taking a short break until 4 p.m. Uh, we will return to our second panel on the role of alternative data in FinTech lending and the regulatory landscape. We will see everyone back here soon. Welcome back everyone. I would now like to introduce our second panel on the role of alternative data in fintech lending. This panel aims to discuss the role that alternative data plays in expanding access to credit via fintech unsecured lending and if LMI individuals are being reached with the use of alternative data. As a reminder, we will have a brief Q&A portion in the last five minutes of our session. You may submit your questions in the Q&A field on the bottom right of your screen and please select all panelists when you submit your question so that we receive it. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this panel, David Silberman. David is the former Associate Director for Research, Markets, and Regulations at the CFPB and currently serves as Senior Advisor to the Center for Responsible Lending and the Financial Health Network, as well as an ad adjunct instructor at Harvard Law School. I would now like to welcome David to introduce our panelists today, Kelly Cochran, Marco DiMaggio, and Patrice Ficklin, and kick off our panel discussion. Thank you. Great privilege and honor to be, to be here with you and to be moderating this panel of experts, especially since two of our panelists are former colleagues of mine who were, my were and continue to be my mentors in this and many other subjects. So our panelists today are Kelly Thompson Co Cochran, who is the Deputy Director of FinReg Lab, which is a nonprofit innovation center that tests new technologies and data to inform public policy and drive the financial sector towards a responsible and inclusive financial marketplace. Prior to joining FinReg Lab, Kelly helped to stand up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and served for seven years as the Assistant Director for Regulations. Kelly previously was counsel at Wilmer Hale, where she advised financial institutions on a wide range of legal and regulatory matters, 
and she also conducted research on financial services innovation and other topics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Patrice Alexander Ficklin is the founding director of and continues to head and inspire the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity at the CFPB. Uh, Ms. Ficklin's office leads and directs the CFPB's efforts to ensure fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit to, for consumers and small businesses. Her pre-CFPB experience includes negotiating complex transactions and leading teams engaged in counseling industry and consumer advocate organizations on regulatory compliance, consumer protection, fair lending, fair housing, and fair employment. Following a gubernatorial appointment and state Senate confirmation, Patrice served on the Maryland Higher Education Commission, providing oversight on Maryland's post-secondary education policies. Finally, Marco DiMaggio has no prior CFPB affiliation. We don't hold that against him. Uh, he is the Organelsi Professor of Business Administration in the Finance Union of Harvard Business School and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. In July 2022, he became the director of the new FinTech Crypto and Web3 Lab at Harvard. Marco's current research focuses on financial intermediation with a particular focus on how new technologies have disrupted financial markets and its effects on firms and individuals. His works have been published in leading academic peer review journals such as the American Economic Review, Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economic, and Journal of Financial Economics. So welcome to all of you. So, although our, the subject of our panel is on alternative data, I think it makes sense to start by just talking a little bit about the traditional data to which alternative data is an alternative. Uh, so, let's talk about, Patrice, let me maybe start with you and ask about what the impact of the traditional credit scoring system has been for low and moderate income individuals and especially for communities of color. Uh, thanks so much, David. Uh, happy to start, but let me just start off by saying I'm honored to join you and Kelly and Marco on this panel. And I wanted to also extend my thanks to Ambika and others at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for inviting me to speak on these important issues today. I do have to start off with a required disclaimer uh, that my remarks um, are being made by me, the a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of our agency, but my remarks do not constitute legal interpretation guidance or advice of the Bureau. To answer your question, the inability to access the traditional credit system remains a significant challenge for many consumers and especially consumers of color. As was mentioned in the last panel, consumers with limited credit histories largely fall into two groups, uh, dubbed credit invisibles by the Bureau's research. Some consumers have no credit record with the national credit reporting agencies. And then the second group are thin file or unscorable consumers whose credit records are not robust enough. They don't have enough recently reported activity or they contain too few accounts. Now, unsurprisingly, credit in invisibility and unscorability both affect communities of color more than other segments of the population. The CFPB's research concludes that the problems that accompany having a limited credit history disproportionately impact African-Americans, Hispanics, and lower income consumers more broadly. But challenges also persist for those who have scorable credit records. Access issues are exacerbated by the prevalence of errors in consumer credit reports, and those errors are more common among consumers of color. Our research has found that even for those with traditional credit scores, Black, Hispanic, younger consumers, and consumers with low credit scores, they are far more likely to have disputes appear on their credit reports than other segments of the population. The research that we released in February found that majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods continue to face significant challenges with credit records. In nearly every category that we reviewed, auto loans, student loans, credit cards, and retail cards, Consumers residing in majority black areas were more than twice as likely to have disputes appear on their credit reports compared to consumers residing in majority white areas. And for auto loans, consumers in majority black areas were more than three times more likely to have disputes appear on their credit reports. Specifically, 2.8% of the accounts in majority black census tracts contained disputes contrasted with 0.8% of accounts in majority white census tracts. 
And we know that when credit reporting is sloppy or rife with errors, this can limit access to credit for communities of color and lower income consumers nationwide. Additionally, I think it's worth noting that when we refer to traditional credit scoring, not all traditional credit scoring models are the same. A good example of this is how paid collections and medical debt are treated in different credit scoring models. We noted in a recent medical debt report that newer versions of some common credit score models consider paid debt differently than older models. For example, FICO score 9 and Vantage score 3.0 and newer versions of these scoring models do not penalize borrowers for paid collections of any kind, including medical collections. And while newer models may still consider unpaid medical collections, some scores consider them with less weight than older models. Thanks, David, for the question. Thank you, Patrice. Kelly or Marco, is there anything you want to add on the subject of how the traditional system affects LMI and people in communities of color before we start talking about alternative data? Take that as no. Know. Great. Then let's uh, let's move on and start talking about alternative the alternative data. So Kelly, let me start with you. In the, the last panel we heard from uh, Opportune and Pedal about their use, particularly of transactional data to do cash flow underwriting. Can you just fill out the picture and talk about how others are using cash flow data and what's known about the predictive its, its predictive power, either as an alternative to traditional data or as a complement uh, to traditional data? Sure, thank you. So, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today to the New York Fed. Um, so, we've done research in this area looking at data from a number of lenders, including um, uh, Pedal and Opportune. And what we found were um, several things. First, that uh, we were looking at loan level data for, for most of the companies that we were working with. And what we found was that uh, the cash flow attributes, largely from bank account data, were um, predictive in their own right and, and, and could be used in situations where traditional credit bureau data wasn't available. We also found that when the two were added together, it often added additional lift so that the two sources of information appear to be providing slightly different information and there can be advantages to combining them where that's an option. But particularly in the context of consumers who can't be scored using traditional models and data, you know, that's uh, an important finding. We also looked at whether the lenders were um, serving populations that historically probably had had struggled to access credit. We had different uh, metrics for different lenders there, but did find evidence of that, including um, with regard to income relative to kind of uh, population geographic income levels. And then finally, we looked at um, demographic factors and found that um, rather than proxying for race or uh, ethnicity or gender, that the data was independently predictive and, and across different demographic groups. Uh, different lenders are using the data different ways to distill different things. Um, it's very wide, uh, kind of diverse at this point, and a lot of different experimentation is going on. So some lenders may be looking at things as average account balances or the patterns of inflows and outflows out of an account. Some people may be using the bank account data to distill information about how consumers are paying rent, utility, or telecom bills, which often are not reflected in traditional credit reports. So there are different ways to use the information, um, but it, as people were saying on the last panel, it's the kind of information that has been used for some time, but it's a new kind of automated source that, um, and, and the digitalization of it allows for some more sophisticated analytics to kind of really understand how the consumer is managing their finances. Um, the, one of the reasons that I think people are interested interested in cash flow data, in addition to the fact that it shows kind of inflows and outflows and cushions and things that aren't available or visible just from a credit report, is also that it can be more timely. Credit report information in the traditional system takes some time to report and feed in, and particularly in times of economic change, for instance, what we've been going through recently, there's uh, a lot of lenders are interested in the information because it can really provide an up-to-date snapshot in a way that traditional data sometimes struggles to do. Let me just ask a sort of a follow-up question, Kelly. There's been a lot of sure. 
good good bit of talk recently about the use of particularly rent data. And I think this week uh, FHA announced an initiative involving the use of rent data, Fannie Mae involved in it. Is the use of rent data or more broadly data from billers like landlords, uh, telecom companies, uh, utilities, is that a different breed of cash from cash flow underwriting or is that simply the same thing with a different name attached to it? Um, so the short answer is it can depend on what the source is. Um, some people are distilling rent or utility or telecom payments from bank account records. Uh, and some people are trying to get it from other sources as well. So it really depends on where the information is coming from. We published a report with the Urban Institute last uh, in late 2021 about this. There's a lot of interest in rental, utility, and telecom data. As we've been talking about already, consumers often pay those bills every month, but only about two to 5% of consumers are estimated to have um, records of those payments appearing in their traditional credit reports. We know that the majority of low income households and the majority of black and Hispanic households are renters. And so, and certainly when it comes to um, evaluating whether a consumer is, uh, it can, has the ability to repay um, a mortgage payment, looking at how they've been paying rent is, is a really logical place to go for that. But different people are looking at different sources. Traditionally, not very many landlords or utility or telecom companies have been willing to, to furnish data into the traditional credit reporting system. There are a number of initiatives and companies that are, are working with those sources, trying to make it easier for those flows to happen. And there are also a number of initiatives that are relying on intermediaries to pull that data um, instead of kind of push it, um, often with consumers' consent. So it might be coming from bank account data or from intermediaries who are kind of scraping the data off, for instance, a utilities customer service internet platform. But there's a, a real broad interest in using that kind of information from a variety of sources, so it can come from different places right now. One last thing real quick about that is this, the type of source affects exactly what information you're going to get. So if you think about a bank account record, it will tell you the day that the rent was um, deducted from the consumer's account, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what the amount of rent was or when it was due. So you can get an overall pattern over time if you see it's coming out at the same time every month, but there are some differences. Whereas if you're pulling it directly from the landlord, you probably know those other pieces as well as when it was actually paid. So different lenders have different preferences as to where the data is coming from. Um, and there's a lot of experimentation going on right now in terms of data sources across uh, different lenders and different players in the market. So, Mark, let me bring you in because your research has really focused on other types of alternative data, uh, particularly education uh, type type data. Uh, so what can you tell us about the uh, the other forms of data that are being used? What promise they hold in 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 underwriting uh, and in managing risk? Sure. So, thank, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, contributing to this. So, uh, let me start by saying that uh, uh, two data points to add two data points to the uh, to the discussion. One is that if we look at the overall uh, uh, sector, uh, especially for unsecured uh, loans, uh, one comparison that we've done was the way in which the underwriting works for traditional lenders versus uh, non-traditional lenders or uh, fintech lenders. And uh, although the study is uh, a couple of years old, uh, what we found there was that there wasn't a big difference uh, in terms of the uh, underwriting itself, uh, which suggests that uh, either the players that are uh, using alternative uh, uh, underwriting models and data are still small in the market, or the ones that do claim to use this type of alternative uh, ways of uh, doing underwriting, um, are not actually innovating to to a big extent, so that uh, we can actually see in the aggregate uh, changes uh, in the composition of borrowers. Uh, so that's sort of true for the average borrower and for the average uh, uh, lender in the market. Uh, then we did one particular. Uh, we focus on one particular uh, uh, example. Uh, where we got access to the underlying uh, uh, data that was used to, to do the underwriting of the borrowers. And as you mentioned, the main alternative data were the digital footprint, which is, has been used before, and then two were, which were new to the literature. One is education and the other one was employment history. 
And what we, we could show was that uh, comparing the borrowers that got funded by this lender uh, with the ones that uh, were not funded or for the ones that uh, would have been funded by a traditional model, uh, which doesn't uh, use this type of alternative data, you will see that these uh, these tend to be uh, borrowers that are on the left tail of the FICO distribution. These tend to be borrowers that have uh, thin credit files uh, and that are uh, that have a FICO score that is below 660. And the the interesting point is that uh, if this is true both on the extensive margin, so whether they get the credit or not, but it's also true in the intensive margin because one could ask the question of whether. To the ones that do get funded, uh, they get charged higher prices uh, just because they can potentially be uh, uh, riskier and this particular lender might prefer higher interest rates uh, rather than denying uh, the, the, these borrowers. What we found is that there is also a difference uh, in the interest rate where these alternative data allow the lender to lower the interest rate in the first place uh, for these new or what we call the invisible primes, the ones that uh, perform very well, don't default on their loans, but are somehow overlooked by the traditional uh, credit scoring system. Um, this is one thing that I, I want to mention in terms of uh, sort of the outcome is that this tends to be, uh, they tend to have sort of strong uh, effects for these borrowers that over time, uh, not only don't, don't uh, default on this particular uh, unsecured loan, but also are more likely to purchase a house, are more likely to be to improve on their other financial health. Uh, and so we can actually measure the benefits of a, a, a better uh, underwriting model uh, at a longer, uh, slightly longer horizon than just the decision of getting this particular uh, loan or not. To be, uh, to be clarified, this is, I think there is a, a nice way of putting it is that there is a, a, a dimension, which is the data, and there is a dimension of the model itself, right? Because one thing that uh, I, um, the, the FICO, I think, gets wrong is that it's very backward looking and it's very static. Uh, not, so there is a question of just the compositional information you get, that the, it gets used to compute the, the FICO score, but there is a question also of the underlying uh, model that is used in conjunction with the FICO, the model that is used by, by lenders. And what we find is that one third of the uh, additional credit or the better financial inclusion you get is coming from the model and two thirds are, is coming from the alternative data. Thank you, that's fascinating, thank you. So Patrice, let me come back to you. We, we've heard all these, uh, both from this, uh, the prior panel and from what Kelly and Marco have said about the, the promises of alternative data uh, of various types, uh, but let's talk about the other side of it, the risks of these of these data. And what kind of risks do you see to LMI borrowers, to communities of color posed by the use of alternative data? And how can we ensure that if, as the use of alternative data expands, it doesn't contribute or reinforce existing structural inequities in, in credit access? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question, David. Thank you. The promises and the perils, right? Um, there are a number of potential risks uh, to using alternative data. Um, I'd like to just sort of talk at a high level about five. Um, the first is data quality issues. Some types of alternative data may raise quality concerns because the data are inconsistent, incomplete, or otherwise inaccurate. Such concerns may arise in part because these data have not historically been used in the credit context or other eligibility decisions. And as a result, the sources of such data may not have been subject to the type of accuracy and quality obligations that would commonly be expected for data to be used in the credit process. Further alternative data may be unrepresentative in ways that create fair lending risks and or unfair. Uh, the second risk that I'd like to just speak for a moment about uh, is around transparency concerns. Some sources of alternative data may not permit consumers to access or view data that are being used in decisions in the credit process or to correct inaccuracies in those data. Transparency issues are compounded if creditors do not disclose the type of data that they're using and let consumers know how those data figure into decisions in the credit process. Another risk is behavioral data that may be unrelated to a consumer's ability to pay back a debt. 
Most traditional credit factors are heavily influenced by a person's own financial conduct. However, some alternative data may not be related to financial conduct, and the use of these data could unfairly penalize LMI consumers and make it more difficult for them to improve their credit standing. As noted by the CFPB and several of our sister agencies in a 2019 joint statement on the use of alternative data in credit underwriting, we stated that using alternative data that are directly related to consumers' finances and how consumers manage their financial commitments may present lower risks than other types of alternative data. A fourth risk is unintended side effects that harm consumers. The use of alternative data could penalize or reward certain groups or behaviors in ways that are hard to understand. For example, members of the military that may frequently move, uh, and that may give them a false sense of instability or false impression of instability that could affect whether they can access credit. Finally, I'll just note broadly the potential for discrimination. Using alternative data may present a greater risk of unlawful discrimination if variables or factors that are used are either proxies for prohibited bases, such as race, ethnicity, or gender, or those data reflect historical structural discrimination. For fintechs entering into this space, our director, CFPB director Rohit Chopra, has made clear that there is no technological exceptionalism. All financial services providers are expected to play by the same rules, no matter the technology being used. And so whether an institution is making underwriting or pricing decisions using a sophisticated algorithm or a pencil and a calculator, the consumer protection laws apply equally. And if an institution cannot use a certain type of technology or a certain type of data in a manner that complies with the law, then it really should not be used. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly or Marco, is there anything you wanted to add before we move on to our next subtopic here? No, okay. We're good, okay. Uh, so let's now talk about sort of the adjacent topic of machine learning of artific and artificial intelligence as techniques. Uh, and obviously machine learning, artificial intelligence can be brought to bear on traditional data, the data that are in credit reports or on alternative data or on both. Uh, and really the question is, what are the opportunities that machine learning and artificial intelligence present? And also what are the risks uh, that, they, that they're posed? Uh, and did, do, do those risks and opportunities vary depending upon either the type of data that's being used fed into the machine or the particular techniques? Uh, Kelly, let me start with you on that. Sure. Um, well, I think in terms of opportunities, there are two things that people are focusing on with machine learning techniques. One is the potential to do more sophisticated and kind of nuanced models that may be able to underwrite groups of consumers who are difficult to evaluate today. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the reasons why, for instance, low and moderate income consumers may have less credit information. There's some um, research that suggests that um, traditional scores may be more, uh, the, the, because of noisiness in the data, traditional scores may be less predictive for consumers who are thin file, who have a history of defaults and other things. And so the, the possibility is that machine learning models may be able to do a more sophisticated job of, of evaluating kind of consumers in, in areas where um, traditional models struggle to, to evaluate. The second thing is that there may be new techniques that um, allow for a broader spectrum of options to really um, explore how to, to find models that are both fair and predictive and um, different ways of kind of approaching some of the challenges in that space given that there are um, disparities in data over time. I think there are three main concerns that come with machine le learning. One is that the models are often more complex and um, more opaque. And so that raises questions that are about our ability to kind of diagnose and, and manage those models over time. That ap applies both to kind of their overall predictiveness, to fair lending concerns, to transparency, and generating adverse action notices for individual consumers to explain if they have been turned down for credit, why that happened. Um, so there's a suite of questions in that space. 
Two other concerns are that um, in some ways the machine learning models can get so nuanced that they become sort of so closely tied to the, the data that they have been uh, that have, have been used to generate them, that they are, are sort of brittle, that they may not um, hold up when, when the, the underlying data or economic circumstances start to change. And on the fairness side, there's a concern that they might actually be even pick up historical disparities in data or even reverse engineer um, race or, or other demographic characteristics that cannot or, or under fair lending laws cannot be used in, in, in lending. So there's a complex mix of questions here, both opportunity and concerns about risks. Um, those occur both with traditional data and with new data. But obviously, if there's a lot of new data with uh, new aspects, that, that creates kind of additional new material. And so people often think of the risks as, as kind of magnifying when you have both together. One interesting question is, on the opportunity side where we're seeing the lift, how much is coming from machine learning, how much is coming from data when, when new data sources are combined? And that's one question that we're hoping to study soon. Um, we, are, we are already looking at some of the questions on the transparency and model management, but um, it's a complex space and, and it is not solely about new data. It's kind of, but when both inter intersect, there's often heightened concern for many stakeholders. Marco, you alluded to that in your earlier comments about the uh, how do you tease out the effect of data versus uh, technique and using the data. What does your research uh, tell us about the, the the power and also the risks of, of yeah. machine learning and artificial intelligence as techniques? I think to make it uh, to make it real, also for the people that uh, are listening to us, one way of uh, of, uh, of doing this is also reverse the question and saying there are risks also in the simplicity. I'll give you one particular example. In the in the paper, we use a, an underwriting model of a top twenty bank. Okay, I'm not gonna name names. This underwriting model they is, begin with the WA? <laughs> is uh, basically a two by two matrix where uh, you have uh, FICO score on one uh, axis and on the other you have uh, DTI, the two income. And uh, if you have a high FICO score or low DTI, you get a certain loan amount. If you have a low FICO score and high DTI, you get denied. And something in between uh, decides basically the uh, the uh, interest rate. Do we believe that that's the best model, even though it's very simple? I think there is a lot of risk of giving of just pushing the simplicity angle, right? Uh, when we look at the uh, the more complex model, what does it mean to be complex? I think there are uh, there is a question about. Uh, use of uh, uh, additional data, right? You can get to a thousand different uh, uh, features of, of this model, which are a uh, somewhat different interpretation of the data that you can find in the credit report, uh, plus some dimensions that are really new uh, to the uh, about the borrowers. Uh, that's one, one angle of that. The other one is uh, the learning aspect. Right, so having a more complex underwriting model also means that this model changes uh, with uh, market conditions. And so as market conditions uh, change, as the borrowers uh, respond in a certain way to market condition, and we have seen the market conditions have been exceptional uh, uh, the last couple of years, uh, the model can adapt much more quickly than uh, a, a simple model like the one that uh, I was uh, joking about before. So there is number of features, there is dynamic aspect of it. And then what's really the, uh, the output here, there is an output in terms of uh, yes or no, so getting or not the loan, and then there is an output about the interest rate, right? And one thing that we show in the data is that the, if you look at the simple model, the simple model is very, very noisy, especially for the ones that are on the left tail of distribution. And so what you tend to do is that for FICO scores that are below 700, the interest rate is pretty flat and the decision of giving or not the loan is pretty flat. This means that you are giving the same, you are assigning the same credit worthiness to somebody who has a 600 credit score and a 700 credit score. Having a, a more quote unquote complicated model allows you to actually distinguish this, right? Which is actually goes in the, in the direction of fairness. Somebody who has who really 
uh, has a higher uh, credit risk should be uh, sh should be paying a higher interest rate or should have a lower probability of being accepted. And I think that's a, a, another way of looking at some of this tension between simplicity and complexity between alternative uh, and novel data. Uh, obviously, there are going to be winners and losers, right? And that's also the interesting part of this. There are going to be some winners uh, that uh, have been overlooked by traditional models uh, because for them uh, they've been too noisy or been too uninformative about the credit worthiness, uh, and the lenders have just decided to uh, uh, underlook them and underserve them. But there are going to be also borrowers that have a very high, uh, let's say, FICO score. Uh, that's on the other characteristics that the new model take into account, uh, they underperform. And so they they can be interpreted as the losers here. They're going to be the ones that somehow they get denied, even if on the traditional variables uh, they look okay. And I think that's I think a little bit of the challenge of then going back to these borrowers and explaining them that uh, while the the traditional uh, variables might be uh, might be too backward looking, and the model uh, is actually looking at really at uh, what's your ability going forward. Which is somewhat what uh, our research uh, hinted towards, which is you look, you, you, you get some borrowers that have been accepted only by the traditional model and not by the, the, the alternative model. And these borrowers tend to have a very high FICO score, but then you look at their income and the lower income, they can be uh, retirees, they can be, you can see a lot of different uh, instances where you can interpret it as, well, going forward, that their abilities to repay, it's actually worse than the ability to repay of somebody who has a fin credit file and a low FICO score. Thank you. So, Patrice, let me ask you what, show my age and ask you what we used to call the $64,000 question. I don't know, today maybe it should be called the six tenths of a hundredth of a Bitcoin question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we've talked about uh, promises and the potentials. We've talked about the risks. But the ultimate question is how do we balance innovation and equitable access uh, with protections, with consumer protections against uh the kinds of things you talked about and Kelly talked about. So can you talk about that and how the regulatory landscape is shifting as more fintech firms and lending institutions explore the use of both alternative data and machine learning techni techniques uh, yeah. and with the hope of expanding lending to the underserved? Yeah, no, that, that that's a great question. And especially for an agency like the CFPB born out of the Great Recession, born out of a financial crisis, and with the really solemn duty of trying to spot emerging risks to consumers. Um, and so this is one area that the Bureau is focused on. And as uh, I think uh, some folks uh, listening to this webinar are probably aware, um, our director has certainly spoken publicly about our focus on the widespread and growing reliance on machine learning models throughout the financial services industry and the corresponding potential for algorithmic bias to emerge. And so, you know, one of the areas um, that we've been noting is the fact that tech companies and financial institutions are amassing massive amounts of data and using it to make more and more decisions about our lives, including, as we've talked about, loan underwriting and advertising. And while machines crunching numbers might seem capable of taking human bias out of the equation, we are concerned that that's not necessarily what's happening. And so at the Bureau, we have been cautioning that we should never assume that algorithms will be free of bias. And if we want to move toward a society where each of us in fact has equal opportunities, we need to investigate whether discriminatory black box models are undermining that goal. And so in that vein, a little bit earlier this year, this summer, we released a circular on adverse action notices as they relate to models including models that use complex algorithms. And in this circular, we made clear that companies that rely on machine learning and other complex algorithms must provide accurate and specific explanations for denying applications, and that companies are not absolved of their legal obligations when using a black box model for their learn lending decisions. In fact, as our director stated, the law gives every applicant the right to a specific explanation if their application for credit is denied and that, that right is not diminished simply because a company uses a complex algorithm that the company doesn't understand. 
Now, aside from adverse action notices that are required by the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, under the Consumer Financial Protection Act, the CFPB is empowered to address unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts or practices committed by any covered person or service provider in connection with any transaction for or offer of a consumer financial product or service. The act defines an act or practice as unfair when it causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, the injury is not reasonably avoidable, and the injury is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. The use of alternative data and advanced machine learning techniques in credit underwriting are one uh, area where discriminatory practices may be occurring that are unfair. For example, certain targeted advertising and marketing based on machine learning models can harm consumers and undermine competition. We've seen reports from advocates, investigative journalists, and scholars showing how data harvesting and consumer surveillance fuel complex algorithms that can target highly specific demographics of consumers to exploit perceived vulnerabilities and structural inequity, leading to what our director has referred to as robo-discrimination. And so here at the CFPB, we are closely examining whether companies' reliance on discriminatory algorithms may be causing significant injury that they cannot reasonably avoid that is not outweighed by countervailing benefits. That's standard for unfair practices that set forth under the Consumer Financial Protection Act. Wherever we encounter harmful conduct in the marketplace, if that conduct violates the federal prohibition against unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, or any other federal consumer law that the CFPB is tasked with enforcing, we will use the authorities granted to us by statute to address that conduct and prevent harm to consumers as we always have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me now turn it over to Ambika for uh, a few minutes of Q&A. Sure, thank you all for such an insightful discussion um, on sort of the opportunities and risks posed by alternative data. I love how our conversation sort of covered the gamut of research and what we've gleaned from a lot of these models, whether it's data on its own or machine learning models to some of the consumer protection concerns associated with this data. Uh, we covered a lot in 40 minutes, and so I thank our panelists for that. Um, so we have a question from the audience and I'm gonna field this to Kelly and Marco, um, but we have not, so this is a question from a colleague at the Philadelphia Fed. Um, we have not seen a downturn in consumer finance in a while. Do you think that may present a challenge to novel ML models and how predictive they are? Um, sure, I mean, I, I can start. I, you know, I think both with regard to um, less traditional data sources and uh, kind of machine learning techniques. One of the questions has been how how will both of these perform during different economic conditions? And when we did our original cash flow research, you know, uh, that was certainly still a question because um, the the economic conditions have been fairly stable kind of over the you know the last decade uh, since the crisis. Um, uh, obviously, we've seen a lot of change since then, um, but very unusual change. I mean, this was not a normal downturn. And so I think there are still questions in that space and there will continue to be as we continue to see how the economy evolves over time. Um, at the same time, I think the fact that there has been so much dynamism is also fueling interest in both of these topics because, you know, as I said, in terms of um, moving to more timely data sources and snapshots and also the ability to use machine learning models that may be able to update more quickly than traditional models, both of those things are of real interest to the market. So I think we will see a lot of um, real probing of this question going forward as, as things continue to evolve coming out of the pandemic. Just to build on uh, what Kelly just mentioned, uh, um, I would say it's a problem for uh, new lenders more than for uh, ML uh, models, uh, in the sense that they may find uh, difficult to to fund the uh, fund the loans. Uh, um, but uh, the ML models, the way in which I I look at this is that at the end of the day, what does the the model allows you to do? It allows you to sort of estimate the elasticity with respect to some type of shocks, right? And basically the question is, well, if this shock is a systemic versus idiosyncratic, is there any big difference? 
right? A shock can be you get unemployed and we can estimate whether the unemployment shock uh, is going to bring your probability of default up by X percent. And now we are saying, well, in a, in a downturn, there are going to be many of these folks going unemployed. Uh, I think the model is sort of, uh, uh, yes, has not gone through that, but at the same time, uh, that elasticity has been estimated, right? We do know to what extent being unemployed uh, is going to lead to uh, to how many default is going to lead to. Uh, and so that can be, can be uh, uh, I think, addressed. Um, the the uh, positive side of this might be the monitoring that comes with the model. Right. There is there is an issue with traditional lenders, which is that once the the loan is uh, uh, is funded, uh, I'm gonna contact the borrower again if there are issues, right? But when there are issues, it might be just too late. What the model allows you to do potentially, if you do monitor it, is that you are gonna understand to what extent the behavior between the time zero at which time the loan has been funded and up to time X, the time in which a default changes, and I can actually intervene beforehand. But there has been, for instance, a lot of modifications that have happened during COVID because some of the lenders have looked at the data and have understood that given what was happening, uh, the fact that, for instance, some of the liabilities, uh, the debt balances were going up, it was worthwhile contacting the borrowers before they were already in default and in uh, allowing them an extension, allowing them a modification of the loan so that to avoid the state of default. Because once you are there, you are just too late. And I think that's part of being proactive uh, plus having a lot more information about these borrowers that can help in a downturn. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, before I wrap up the Q&A, David, is there anything you wanted to jump in with? I noticed that you unmuted. Uh, I guess I guess I would say in conclusion that it seems to me that one of the great issues of our time is how to create a credit underwriting system that does not perpetuate uh, the effects of past discrimination uh, and that enables Folks who have been left out or left behind to actually gain access. You know, we live in a, so in a society in which wealth begets wealth, and the absence of wealth begets the absence of wealth. Uh, and if we're going to turn that around, we need to sort of figure out uh, ways of extending credit to uh, to folks who's because of all sorts of historical discrimination may not look like uh, traditional borrowers, and that that's what this is all about. Absolutely. And uh, also, Patrice, if you have any final remarks, uh, I'd be happy to also give you a moment to share as well. Yeah, I, I would just close by saying that that from the CFPB's perspective, the bottom line is when considering what variables or data or model to use in connection with a credit transaction or other financial product or service, institutions just have to make sure that they're not unlawfully discriminating or otherwise violating the law. And really, the, the kind of the best place to, to be with regard to variables are those that really have an understandable connection to a consumer's finances um, and, and, and really avoiding situations where variables are connected to or otherwise might be linked to various prohibited bases, such as race, sex, ethnicity, age, religion, and several other protected characteristics that are enumerated in the relevant consumer protection laws. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Patrice, and thank, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that participated on this panel. We have reached the end of our second and final panel on the role of alternative data in fintech lending. Um, I'd like to thank David, Patrice, Marco, and Kelly for joining us today and sharing their thoughts on the opportunities and challenges associated with the growing use of alternative data. Um, we are now approaching the end of our event, and we are so thankful to our presenters, speakers, and all of you in the audience for joining us today. I will now pass the mic to our Director of Community Investments, Jonathan Cavell, to provide closing remarks. Thank you to everyone who attended today's conference. Thank you to the participants, and thank you to my colleagues at the New York Fed for making this afternoon's event happen. In particular, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Ambika Nair, for all her hard work leading up to the conference. Thank you, Ambika.
We hope everyone found the presentations and panels informative as you think about your own organization's work and its relationship to unsecured consumer loans and low and moderate income low and moderate income individuals and families. Our event today is part of the New York Fed Community Development Team's broader work in household financial well-being, through which we've examined issues such as the expiration of New York State's eviction moratorium, home ownership for low and moderate income households, and issues around household debt in general. We ask everyone to please be in touch as we aim to make today's conference the first in a series of efforts around the impact of FinTech on low and moderate income households. Also, we have an event coming up on October 26th where we will explore issues around the financing and development of service-enriched affordable housing for seniors. We encourage you to register and attend as that is an in-person event. Thank you again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.